Hello everyone, bonjour tout le monde, and welcome to Concordia University's fourth space. Thank you for joining us for Art Education's Research Pavilion here this morning during Open House. We are joined by four Art Education graduate students eager to speak to you about the program itself and their own research projects. To help situate you, we are streaming to YouTube live from Fourth Space, which is located on unceded indigenous lands here in Jage, Montreal. And we'd like to extend our gratitude to the Kanyankahaga Nation, who are the caretakers for the lands and waters we're meeting on today for their teachings about the earth and our relations. At Fourth Space, we work with our university community to mobilize and exchange knowledge by co-creating daily activities such as today's. So it's our pleasure to have collaborated with Art Ed to make this conversation possible. And we're grateful to the folks who made it into the space here today, whether online or in person. I think I'll pass it over to Emma now to get us started. Welcome. Thank you so much, Anna. <laughs> I'm just going to share our slides here in full screen. Uh, so my name's Emma June Hubner, and I'm a PhD student in the Department of Art Education. I also did my master's in the same program, so I know what's going on uh, pretty well. I'm also a high school media arts teacher and a multidisciplinary artist. And around this table, I have some of my incredible colleagues that are sitting here, and they're going to each uh, introduce uh, each other, starting from this end of the table with uh, Victoria. Hi, so I'm Victoria Stanton. Um, I am in my third year of the PhD program. I'm a professional artist, and I'm also a studio art part-time instructor here at Concordia University. Thanks, Victoria. Thanks. Um, my name is Stacy Can. I'm a third year PhD candidate. Uh, I'm also a professional artist and a community art educator. Hello, uh, my name is Jose Cortez. I am a second year PhD student. I am a transdisciplinary artist originally from Mexico City and I'm very happy to be here and share some of our projects. So to start out our conversation, um, we're just going to talk a little bit about the programs that we have for graduate students. Uh, we have a master's in art education, and there are two options if you choose to take this program. There is the course-based option, where you do different courses throughout your two years, and then there's also thesis-based, where for one year you'll take your courses, and the second year you get to take on a research project of your own, um, and this uh, under any, diff any different in uh, topics that interest you. And the same goes for, uh, well, for PhD, it's you write, you do write a, a whole dissertation so there is no course-based uh, option and uh, after taking a, a few courses in our department you'd carry out your dissertation uh, research project and we have uh, different professors uh, that can support you throughout this process uh, whether your interests lay more in research creation all the way to uh, design-based research if you want to deploy some sort of project that's more concrete within a school class like in a classroom there are uh, people with the expertise that can support you in any of these uh, different areas to move on into our discussion um, well, unless, Stacey, you have something to add? Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. yeah I, I just wanted to mention yeah. that in both the MA and PhD program, the program supports both uh, arts-based mm -hmm. and uh, more traditional uh, thesis dissertations, so you could do an art-based thesis yeah. as well. Thanks for that. And I think while we're going to discuss a little bit of our own projects and this, the variety of projects that come out of our, our department will become clear because we're all working on very different uh, topics and we have very different interests um, that are, I think, mostly, well, they're anchored in our, who we are as artists, as teachers. Um, so we're going to jump right into discussing all this research. And uh, first off, I have uh, Stacy, who is going to be presenting a little bit of her, um, well, an idea of what she's doing for her PhD. And this is all work in progress. So I think we should just keep that in mind uh, as, we're, as we're talking about, these, uh, about this research. Stacey. Uh, thanks, Emma. So just to put it in context, I'm kind of in the data collection process of my, my thesis right now. So uh, just kind of the beginning of the thesis process. Um, my thesis is on collaboration in the university classroom, and I'm really interested in the way that students learn from each other um, within the collaboration process, in particular in studio arts. 
Thanks, Stacy. Victoria. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure that I'm going to be as concise as Stacy was, but I'll do That's my okay. best. <laughs> Go for it. it can be longer. We have an hour. Um, uh, so as I was saying, I'm in my third year of the program in art education. Um, the, the working title of my research is uh, modeling, cueing rest, modeling recovery, thinking about performance art and pedagogy in a post-COVID context. And this is work that actually stems from um, several years of research within my performance art practice in contexts largely in Montreal, occasionally internationally, um, where I've become more and more distilled in how I'm thinking about how performance plays itself out, not just on stage, but in public intervention or infiltrating contexts, and the notion of performative presence in all kinds of contexts. So I'm really curious about slowing down. I'm really curious about thinking about what it means to stop, what it means to quote unquote do nothing. And particularly curious about what happens when that's placed in both a, so to speak, art world context in performance events in art events, but also what happens when we bring those kinds of processes into the art classroom. Um, so in teaching performance art as well as practicing performance, um, there is, yes, also a lot of collaboration that happens in that process. There's a lot of dialogue that happens in that process. Those are two focuses that come up in my work um, in a really strong way. And I really want to look at how actions that take place in the classroom in many ways feel and look like the kinds of work that I might do or see in the quote unquote professional art context. So I'm thinking about the hierarchy between the art world and the art classroom, if there's ways to kind of dismantle that hierarchy and in so doing thinking about getting young artists in the classroom thinking about what their work could look like um, in the professional context through the bias of slowing down processes, really thinking about um, and activating this space of non-action or non-doing. And so that, that's what's really propelling my practice, my work, um, and the desire to want to be in this context, thinking about pedagogy, how pedagogy has become an increasingly important factor in thinking through all of these questions, how pedagogy plays out both in conventional and perhaps less orthodox situations, contexts, proposals. Can I ask a question? You absolutely can, <laughs> yes. Um, so are you going to be working with uh, classroom teachers? Like what, what, uh, which participants or how are you carrying out this research? Um, it looks as though it's likely that I'll be continuing to work with young artists. Oh, well, I should say with students of art who are not necessarily young artists. In some cases, these are artists who already have practices. Um, strong practices, histories of work um, and exhibition, but who are um, orienting their practice towards performative ways of thinking and being in their work. So that creates their own personal performative turn where they're thinking about notions of the performative in relation to material. And so sometimes these are artists who have been practicing but are rethinking how they're thinking about their relationship to the studio, to their material, to their work. Um, so I envision a classroom context situation where I'm putting into practice these ideas with other artists in a, in a learning context. Thank yeah. you. And Jose, I'm going to give you the mic. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. Um, well, just as I mentioned before, I am a transdisciplinary artist. I call myself this way because I come from the visual arts, but I started expanding my practice to other mediums through my career up to the point that I uh, also in, incorporated teaching or uh, pedagogies in my practice. And so I'm interested now in uh, pedagogy as an art medium. And the first uh, year of my research, I envisioned this um, radical pedagogy model of an art school called the Raw Institute. And the Raw Institute is an idea of a spurious um, school that uh, gives more um, importance to what is between the moment of teaching and the moment of art presenting. I'm going to read a little bit of it, and then I'm going to explain it uh, further. Adopting the moniker of uh, RAW, I focus on the creation's crude, untapped, and undiluted potential as a drive for social reflection. The RAW Institute as a spurious entity favors in discipline and uncooked art experimentation. 
blurring the theoretical and methodological boundaries to encourage oblique art learning. So this pretty much came out of my years of teaching. I've been teaching for about 10 years in higher education settings. And I found out that a lot of the probably most uh, uh, valuable moments for students happen in between the demand from the program or the relationship with the professor or the in-between assignments or things that uh, usually are demanded from a, pro from a program, like the normativity of the uh, outcome-based uh, school settings. So all these things that are lost in the way of being professionalized are kept somewhere in the back mind of artists and what happens with all this stuff. So I found uh, as an artist, uh, being a teacher, I found this, this practice being also, it's, it's really enriching, but at the same time, it's really frustrating because you see uh, many things transform and also on many times not for the good uh, end of them. And I, I connect a little bit with some of the things that uh, Victoria talked about, the performative uh, practice too. So um, I'm interested uh, more in, um, in, in trying to um, design devices. I call them devices in a more conceptual way because I don't want to call assignments. I don't want to call them tools. I don't want to uh, call something that you put in between the person you are working with and yourself. As a, as a teacher, I don't believe that art is something that can really be taught, but I prefer to put myself in the position of a provoker. I think it's important to provoke art to happen in the whatever art setting is. So the Raw Institute is a conceptual framework to start uh, designing and making up these kind of uh, devices or conditions for art to happen in the classroom or outside the classroom. This makes me think, um, and I'm not sure if either of you mentioned it, um, because I forgot to mention it, and I think it's important in this context. So I'm doing a research creation PhD, um, and I think that that's framing Jose's practice as well, not Stacy. Okay, you could say more about that after. But I mention it because, uh, Stacy, you brought up earlier in talking about what the program and the department can offer. So in that case, it means that this final work will be a dissertation and an artwork just to say that that is part of how the evaluation of um, my work will be sort of in the final instance. So I think it's, yeah, it's worth to point out that the art education offers that as an option for your work in the in the grad student life, yeah. As maybe Stacy, do you wanna speak a little bit more to well, what, kind, what methods you're using in your research? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so although art making is a huge part of, of uh, my research, my students will be making art with each other, uh, and it will be used as part of a, a data set that I'll be looking at. I'm using phenomenology as a as an overarching methodology uh, to look at the experiences of the students. So, um, although I'm interested in the end product, I'm really interested in the experiences and especially in the post COVID, or I don't know if I want to say post COVID, but the whatever stage of COVID we're currently in now, um, how we can create structures that support students in their early career as artists and that transition between being student artists and, and being emerging professional artists. And I, I mean, this is right now just a hypothesis, but having these support structures between students as they move outside of the institution and really uh, connecting with each other, being able to support each other, um, I think will hopefully set them up uh, for some of the challenges that being an emerging artist uh, proposes. And uh, Jose, do you, is your uh, research also research creation based? Yes, my, uh, my project is research creation based. So yeah, yeah I'm trying to Actually, the, the creation of pedagogical tools is part of the production, like art production, and the whole ambition of a model of an art school is considered as an artwork. So. Um, and to add to all this discussion, I'm actually doing uh, design-based research. Um, my focus 
is I'm building on my on my master's research. So during my master's, which was actually directly called museum education through social media, I evaluated what museums were doing on social media and then the way that young adults and teenagers were responding to the content, what they thought was successful, less successful, what they were learning, what they would recommend. And from this research, um, I came up or it led to what I'm going to be doing for my PhD, but I'm in my first year. So um, for the very initial stages, uh, but I'm hoping to develop collaborative uh, pedagogies with museums. So essentially right now, museums are creating content and sharing it with visitors online, but they're not having, um, I'm speaking generally, there are some exceptions, but uh, I'd love for visitors to be able uh, to create content with the museums themselves and to be something that is done uh, collaboratively, especially because teenagers have specific ways of using these apps. And um, I think that uh, museum educators can learn a lot from what uh, the way the creative ways they use these apps and then that the teenagers, it'll be a learning process in and of itself to be able to go to the museum and work on developing uh, content like this. Um, so essentially design based research is we're going to I'm going to collaborate with my the youth and the museums who will be um, researchers with me in this and we're going to work on developing this as a project together um, and see see where it goes basically but uh, I have a little ways to go before uh, we get there um, but that gives you an idea basically of different types of research because we have uh, research creation uh, qualitative phen uh, phenomenology research design-based research so I think we represent quite a few of the different paradigms that are coming out um, of our department and also it speaks to the expertise of our supervisors who um, are able to support us uh, throughout this process. In addition to uh, research, uh, as graduate students, we're involved in so many other different types of activities, whether they be uh, things that we've developed on our own based on our interests, that then our department supports us to carry these ideas to uh, fruition, or sometimes our supervisors have projects and they call on our own expertise because uh, we've all, we all come from different backgrounds and um, often uh, our, our point of view and our perspective and our expertise is really taken into account in all these projects and we really have our say and our voice uh, to help guide these projects. Uh, so we're going to uh, go over a few of the different um, initiatives that we have in our department. There are many more and we're only featuring very few, the few that we can speak to. And even I'm sure we could speak to more of them, but we're limited in time today. So we're going to keep it to what we have, but we will close our presentation eventually with um, a glimpse into a few other initiatives that our colleagues who are not here today, um, well, some of their initiatives so we can, so they can be featured as well a little bit in, uh, in this discussion. So our first, project um, that uh, we have, I think you are the found, are you the founders? I don't know what the right word is. You can be, you'll be able to talk more about it, but out of our department, we now have a Bureau of Non-Competitive Research. And I don't want to say too much, but I know that all three of you are involved in it to a certain extent. So um, I'm going to pa pass the mic, go for it and tell us what is the Bureau of Non-Competitive Research? What do you do? Who are you? <laughs> um, so I think I can safely say that that Victoria and I are, are directors at the bureau, directors. Um, but we do bring in bring in other people depending on what the project is. Uh, the project um, kind of stemmed out of our own collaborative research um, that we were doing as actually a pilot project in one of our, our courses. Um, and maybe I'll just speak to my own part of the research and Victoria can kind of put it together with how how that went, but I was really interested in collaboration. And so I proposed to Victoria that we do a collaboration I didn't know what that would quite look like. Um, this was during COVID so we were online, so that was also kind of another. Another part of this, but we were really interested in just kind of exploring ideas. And uh, some of the ideas that came out of it, we want to write about. And one of the problems that we were having was this idea that when you publish, you have to kind of 
put one person in front of the other. So there's a first author and a second author. So we decided to create a, a portmanteau. We, we weren't sure what we were going to do, but we wanted to create something that we could write under um, where it wasn't one of us always first and the other person second. So uh, we came up with a whole list of ideas and the Bureau of Non-Competitive Research uh, won out, I guess, in, in the, the naming. But the other idea of it being a bureau was that we could bring people people in and, and we roped Jose in eventually. And he could speak more to that perhaps. That's great. Yeah, that's a really good introduction. I'd add to that, um, like Stacy was saying, it came together during the pilot project class that we did together during the pandemic. Well, still in, but during the online portion of our learning experience. Um, and I was thinking a lot about dialogue and looking at this notion of conversation as method as a kind of methodology. So it seemed to fit well with Stacy working on collaboration and me working in conversation and dialogue that we would share in each other's research. And this became a series of conversations that we had with this idea that how can we invite other people into this ongoing series of conversations. Some of the points that we were looking at together with our overlapping interests included, what does it mean to slow down in the classroom? Collaboration is by necessity a process of slowing down. You have no choice. I mean, you can be dictatorial about your collaboration, but if you're in a more consensus-based or democratic process of dialogue and collaboration. So it was thinking about these ideas that motivate both our research and theoretical underpinnings and just what we wanted to do together. So that turned into a series of, well, it turned into an article that we wrote based on a conversation that we had under the name of the Bureau, which ironically, they ended up publishing our names anyway. <laughs> like, of course. <laughs> and they put my name first. I'm like, this doesn't, what? So again, you know, they, the, the machine won out as it were, which is funny. It just gave us something to think about moving forward and that turned into a series of conversations online that was supported by the cslp um, the center for study of learning and performance here at concordia affiliated with the art education program um, which was wonderful to have their support to put together a series that brought people from both montreal and other places in the world to talk about their research their practices artists and their thoughts on notions of slowness both in pedagogy and in art practice from different perspectives, notions of non-competitiveness within these realms, um, which turned into another series of workshops that were opened up to various other members of both the Concordia community and other institutions in Montreal. Um, so we had various other students, including people in art education, Sarah Handley among them, to offer a movement-based workshop a couple of students um, from the art history program here, master students um, who offered an experiential hands-on, what does it mean to look at art in public? How do we slow down a process of how we express that embodied experience of public art and then art in institutional contexts in the museum? It kind of condensed conversations that were happening in real time in person coming out of the online experience. So. Jumping forward, um, we have another collaboration underway uh, within which we managed to rope in Jose. Um, so we're working on it's top secret for now, but we've got um, a project coming up together in the fall that the three of us are now um, conceiving um, that's really going to, among other things, there's, a, there's definitely a tremendous element of tongue in cheek, but tongue in cheek that wants to um, look at serious questions within an academic scholarly research context and also an art world context, like the institution of the museum. Um, so the bureau is going to become a bureau in the fall. I will not say more about it, but Jose, maybe you want to add something about um, your thoughts on, <laughs> on this direction that we're now leading you in. Thank you. Uh, no, I think very, um, very, uh, I feel very honored to be to be collaborating with the bureaus inside a kind of uh, know you on the the first projects that happened last year, I guess. Um, I uh, I kind of felt there was something interesting there going on for in in connection to some of my experiences and how I also feel about the institutional settings and the of course art 
world career setting and um, for this uh, upcoming collaboration, I think we are also connecting with the institution in the real sense of of it and trying also to connect or to, um, let's say, engage with the pedagogical aspect of an institution. And the bureau needs to or will probably become, as you said, a proper bureau in, in order to really, to really analyze all these situations in real time and space. So I think it's a very exciting moment. And I also have to say this is a great uh, situation going on in relation to all the collaborations that happen in the department, which is fantastic. I think it's a very nice community that work together all the time. Sorry. This is happening. The projects that we've done are in direct correlation with support that we've received exactly. through art education, through the CSLP, through Project That's Someone. True. So there's been a tremendous amount of support in in giving us, in some sense, direction, in some sense, carte blanche, and saying we trust you. Um, you've got ideas, go. So I just wanted to interject to say that a lot of this is coming out because of the fact that we're getting support directly through um, the program and, and satellite um, satellite programs that circulate around and, and collaborate with. Did you want to say anything? I didn't mean to cut you off there. Did you want to say anything else? Okay. Well, Victoria, you just mentioned Project Someone, and I think that's actually <laughs> the next slide. <laughs> um, and the reason I put up a slide here about it is because I've also I've worked on many projects uh, with Project Someone, and just as a brief, uh, like the official, and I realize moving our faces on the Zoom, um, as an official uh, definition or description of Project Someone. Um, it's a project that works to build awareness, create spaces for pluralistic dialogues and combat discrimination and online hate. Our multimedia materials, art installations, training, curricula and programs aim to prevent hate speech and build resilience towards radicalization that leads to violent extremism. Um, and I've been called to work on various projects because of my classroom experience. So I teach in grade 11 media arts and uh, because um, I have a pretty good awareness of the government programs and what teachers might need. I have a lot of colleagues um, that are also teachers. Um, I was uh, asked recently, I'm going to speak just to one of the projects, to develop something that we called um, Explore Your Echo which I made a little slide. And basically, uh, Explore Your Echo is a pedagogical toolkit. So there is, that is divided into three, and it starts with a section that's for university professors or instructors. So the idea was to first reach the university where uh, student teachers are coming to get their training to become teachers. And the, uh, the aim of it is to help uh, youth develop um, skills to combat online hate through art making. So it's, uh, it's really based in art for social change. And the toolkit brings you to discover artists from around the world who create art for social change. And by the end of the unit, uh, students are asked to then also uh, contribute to um, an online space where they can discuss things that they might be experiencing, whether that be metaphorical or in di like literal direct translations of what they might be experiencing. And we also, obviously, it's a very sensitive topic. So there are a lot of um, tools to deal with uh, how to discuss sensitive topics in the classroom, how to create that space for dialogue with students so that all of this can happen in a way that um, in the safest, it's never quite, it's safest way possible to be able to talk about these things. And I think that uh, it's important to have that space because um, as long as we're in a discussion with our students, then it's the only way that we can actually hopefully address this. And as a high school teacher, um, I can definitely speak to the fact that my students live most of their friendships online. Like that is where their friendships are happening. And I think there's a, 
a big struggle these days to navigate between their online identity and their in-person identity. And I've talked a lot with Jose recently about this, but it's like a new way that um, people have to be, or people are developing, they're developing two identities simultaneously and they don't necessarily fit together. Um, and I think this is just one way to open up the dialogue and talk a little bit more and maybe hopefully bridge that eventually. Um, and as I said, it's in three parts. So there is the guide for the instructors to work with student teachers. Then there's the guide for teachers and there's the guide for the student um, to be able to follow. So all the terms and everything that, the, that you learn to better understand some of the invisible mechanisms that we can understand behind what's going on online are explained. Um, but we, we also talk to the fact that a lot of what is online is the black box and it's hard to know sometimes how certain things come to the surface. Um, but it's a, it's a pedagogical tool and it is online if anyone's uh, interested on the CSLP uh, website. And uh, we're hoping that more and more teachers will be picking it up and using it um, in their classrooms. So that's Explore Your Echo or Explore Ton Echo. It's all translated. <laughs> I think this is another, uh, well, Jose is going to move on to talk a little bit more about um, landscape of hope and hate. Um, but it's also an initiative that's coming out of Project Someone. So I'm going to pass, pass the mic to you. And uh, we're really promoting the project right now. <laughs> I don't really want to take up too much time on, uh, <laughs> on this, but uh, it's important also to mention because this is a collaboration between faculty and students and also other uh, other educational institutions. So Landscape of Hate and Landscape of Hope are uh, two initiatives that started around six years ago, 2017. And they're pretty much based on multimedia uh, performances and also workshops and also talks and all kind of intermediation that relates to uh, give space to pluralistic voices in relation to hate and how we handle hate in our common uh, contemporary life and uh, involving art as something that could also make us reflect on those kind of phenomena inside of uh, the institutions and outside of them. So it's a pretty um, expansive project. And uh, I've been collaborating with this, um, um, uh, with this project since last year. I have to mention that a uh, part of the faculty involved there, it's uh, Vivek Venkatesh, who is the chair of the, of the department, and um, Owen Chapman um, from the communications department uh, faculty. I think he's uh, uh, the chair too. Um, um yeah martin lalonde from uh, the ucam um all, uh, jesse Weyer, who is a postdoc uh, from alberta university and uh, annabelle broad who is also a, a teacher and a phd from art therapy in concordia um, department and um well a bunch of other really great artists that have been working together uh, last year, what we are uh, looking in that slide is uh, one of the projects that are, is Halka, which was uh, um, um, developed through a small residency for a week in, here at, at, at Montreal, and that was presented at St. Jack's Church, which is very close to Concordia University. And the concept around it was uh, Halka means um, gentleness and slowness, uh, a way of uh, practice and putting uh, art and these hard topics together in a way of letting us go through the creative process in a more subtle, gentle, and kind of lightweight. And so it was a composition, multimedia composition, because it involved a, a circus performance, uh, actual like visual art performance, for, performative actions, music, of course, and um, a very renowned um, musician, um, Ivar Johnstorn from, um, from Norway. Uh, it was a very nice spectacle. Uh, and also to say that this same project with another name, Landscape of Hate, what happened here at the Ford Space last summer, uh, involving also a different setting. Let's say this is a band, actually it's a band, but it has members that come in and out, depending on what it is presented. Each, 
each presentation is unique and different. So what happened here was a one, um, a two week residency at the Ford space that ended up happening, have, having three performances live. And um, we can see, I don't know if they already screen out this video where you can see a little bit of, of uh, what happened. And well, this is another of the collaborations that are happening um, thanks to the all uh, the CSLP project, someone and the art education department. You want to add something to this? Well, I think now they're sharing part of the video, but <laughs> it's um, I actually put together multiple videos um together in a loop to kind of feature all the different things that are happening in our department and okay well the first video that was in that was projected was not at all <laughs> in a complete different aesthetic than uh what uh, uh, the landscape of hate residency was i'm not are you are we working on putting up the video oh yeah we are okay um and we, I'll just because this is going to run for two minutes, so I don't know if we have two minutes of talking before the actual um, video of Landscape of Hape comes up. But uh, this is actually it's a, a dance project that I put together with uh, well that I I made with my my younger sister, and uh, just to sp speak to my artistic practice while this is uh, <laughs> while this is playing, I do something called screen dance where. Most of what we do is uh, improvised, and we work on re-choreographing our movements afterwards through video editing. And this piece that's playing is uh, exploring nature as architect, well, mother nature as architect, as the architect, and human as architect, um, on Fogel Island in Newfoundland, where there are four different uh, art studios that have been uh, created, and. Um, so we, we we made this video and uh, we often try and collaborate in different uh, natural settings across Canada. So we can look at it for a few moments and I'm not sure if there's a way for if we can advance the video to the next one so that we can perhaps um, speak, uh, Jose can speak a little bit to the other video that comes after. Fast forward through, and this is uh, now what you can see that's being shared is an excerpt from the residency that was held in the space we're discussing uh, in right now. And um, so the, this is what Jose was talking about, where they came together for a week and uh, created together. And maybe you want to add a few things as the video is playing about what actually happened in this space, what you did, and perhaps who was there. Sure. OK, so these uh multimedia experimentation residency uh, that happened last August uh, between Seven Sound and Image Artists uh, was about exploring hopeless horizons and horizonless hopes in our current landscape of hate. This 10-day residency was open to the public with special artist performances on August 17, 18, and 19th. Uh, this event featured artists Jesse Bayer, Annabel Broad, Owen Chapman, Nick Forrest, uh, Veronica Mocker, Vivek Benketesh, and myself, with the production assistance from Marek Datir Benketesh, Nathan, Gabriel Kutera, and Kathleen W. Kuzik, and also Marin Miller. Uh, some of these people also are part of, a, of the university, or collaborators in many ways. And for this uh, project that was um, happening for um, in, in the space of the, well, the four spaces, it's a very flexible space, uh, um, just to kind of give you a scene what was going on, like the three visual artists, it was Veronica, Jesse, and I were working in different um, stations, developing like, installation work that integrated with the music that was also being put together during the, all the days working here. And it ended up in an environment um, that we were activating at the time of the performances. Like I worked with some live collage uh, things. Um, and Veronica worked with some videos, and Jesse was working, lecturing live and putting text on a, on a wall on a projector, reflecting on the topics that I just mentioned in in, in connection to the to the conceptual framework of landscape of hate. Uh, so this is an ongoing project that um, will probably have other other uh, venues to perform in, and yeah, it's it's has been a very really nice experience, also derived from the department and the collaborations here. 
Um, so I think the, the two different examples in the videos that we just show also um, reflect that our department is very multidisciplinary. So although we're primarily visual arts, clearly we all, the work that we just saw also shows that we are sound artists and that there are also, I, I'm also a dancer um, so, and there's performance art. Um, so depending on your artistic background, there's definitely, um, you'll find other people in our department who to collaborate with uh, without a doubt. Um, to close our discussion today, we wanted to also speak to a few other projects so of our colleagues who aren't necessarily here today. Um, so would it be possible to uh, stop sharing the video and I'm going to resume our slides so that we can just speak to a few more. Oh, I have to. And feel free to add things because um, our colleagues aren't here today to uh, talk about them and I'm going to do my best, but they are really just summaries and overviews to um, give you a glimpse <laughs> of all the extraordinary work that um, they're doing. So other work coming out of our department. The first uh, research is by May Bisset. Um, her master's research was called Sites of Learning, Rural Artist Residencies in the East, West, and North of Canada, Turtle Island. And uh, she provided a few uh, different images. She went to, she attended different residencies and looked at um, the experience of remote uh, artist residencies. And she just graduated, so her work is online if you're interested in finding out more about um, in her experience in these residencies, because it was from an autoethnographic auto point of view. <laughs> I'm just going to leave these up for a few seconds. Then we have um, AI, AR, the artist and the art class by Gian Mosalim. And if you are on campus, she is here all day today um, in the EV building discussing her work as well. Um, so I encourage you to go oh, to change locations and go uh, chat with her directly if you have questions. But she essentially looks at the um, role, um, well, the difference between um, well, the borders between traditional and AR generated art. So she does generate um, images out of AI to produce her artworks that she then paints. And then through augmented reality, we get to hear the um, her participants point of view that are in her uh, portraits. So we have a few of the different people that she um, interviewed for her project and then painted. And if you do have a cell phone and you're at home and you feel like scanning these uh, with the Art Vive app, you can scan it and you'll be able to hear and see um, the augmented reality component of these artworks. And I know that to create these paintings, participants had to describe themselves in then this description was fed to the AI, which was given a description. And then from that um, AI image, she could then paint. Then we have uh, Nancy Long, who's working on um, a tolerance for ambiguity, ambiguity. So her piece, her research, her thesis title in uh, in progress is developing skills and tolerance for ambiguity, the value of doubt in the high school art classroom, and she looks at failure and how high school uh, students navigate uh, the fear of failure. Actually, because we're often pressured, as I'm speaking from I, but I, I relate a lot to her research. To we are we do have to grade students, and um, Nancy was a high school teacher as well, and she is looking at how to help students um, through uh, enjoy the process of making art and not always trying to attain a certain uh, grade or a certain perfect outcome, and to be able to 
um, develop this tolerance that is in her title. And uh, she is also a an artist and we have a few, and I realized I don't think the video is gonna play, but she works on um, stop mo she does stop motion by erasing. And so that you can, instead of redoing um, her images every, um, instead of having multiple images, she erases and reworks from the base image. And that this is also a way of her to explore um, that, that there is no finished product because you're always erasing to move forward to the next frame. And if any of you have anything to add, if I'm not articulating her work properly, please, please add anything. Um, but this is, I'm, I'm, this is what I understood from what she's doing. Um, and I know that she's interested in also teaching perhaps students to do this because it's not something, it's something she learned as later on in life, this technique of erasing to animate. And it's too bad that I realized that this won't play. And then she also had an art project where she developed a structure to trace environments uh, that you can wear. And in the photo on the right, you can kind of see that there's a, with her sweater, it's hard to, it's hard to see, but there's a, a back brace and it's a wooden structure where she can insert acetates. Um, and she develops, uh, well, she draws using this structure, the different environments that she sees and she's conducted she's done many different art projects using this structure i think this one is from during her time in residency in uh, in iceland oh and the last uh, project in this series of slides i'll pass the mic to jose and we have a few minutes you can talk about um your work and then we're going to open it up to the chat online and see if anybody has any questions for us so jose here you go Okay, um, yeah, just uh, adding another artwork make uh, in collaboration with a class, a studio class last year, uh, um, graduate studio class. Uh, this work is based on, no, my, some of my visual work is based on the idea of uh, the invisible or the in, in unperceived phenomenon around us. So this is a series of portraits made in relation of missing people profiles. Uh, we, during this, this class, I collaborated with my, my peers in the class and uh, I matched the profiles of some missing people in, in Quebec, Montreal and Quebec, and some in Canada that matched the exact uh, age and some of the physical appearance of uh, participants. And then I, I made some very, uh, fast sketches of these of these profiles these pictures and then i pass it through an ai filter and i created this uh this other portrait so the portraits were presented in a group show and the names of the people who are missing were presented as an artist of the show in a like a mock invitation that i designed so it was pretty much the resemblance of these people who are not present for uh, one reason or another and the way to bring them in the space of art where art is also a very strange practice where we are always showing up and it's pretty much about presence and reaffirming your presence and i just try to see into the other side of it when somebody is not present for whatever reason happens and just playing out with this uh situation of the absence or the in between those those two uh social practices art and life so yeah, that's pretty much it. It's just another result of a of a program uh, course. Thank you. So, is there anything else on the slideshow? Um, well, that was the last uh, slide, but uh, we just got oh, there's another picture of your artwork. <laughs> And there are currently no uh, questions in the chat, but we still have a few minutes left. Uh, we'll, I'll leave the slide up with the uh, link to our department so you can go take a look at that. But in the meantime, um, I think that perhaps because we have 10 minutes left, we can talk about per what makes the program at Concordia uh, special for you. Like what, uh, how has your experience been so far and why is it special to you? And if whoever would like to start. I'll jump in. Yeah, go for it. Um, I, along with Stacy and in part Jose, started my program, the PhD program, uh, right at the beginning or really near the beginning of the pandemic. And I have to say, um, 
having very little sense or idea of how that would go, I was incredibly amazed at our capacity, and that includes the support of the teachers with whom we worked, the professors that conducted these classes online, were able to create community despite or within the constraints of not being able to physically be with each other in the concrete space of the actual campus. Um, and I want to just point that out because I also think that speaks a lot to the culture of the community in art education, that the fact is that art education does cultivate community within the program, which kind of transcended the online experience. We were still able to bring that into our experience. So I feel that that's an element of the program that really stands out for me. And it, like that, that speaks to a certain quality of education that the program offers with regards to a quality of life within the program itself that does really cultivate community. Thanks, Victoria. And I would say just to maybe add to that, perhaps that's uh, one of the reasons why collaboration is, uh, at least to me, it seems quite common uh, within our our department. Um, I've collaborated not just with Victoria, but with other students as well um, throughout, especially during my coursework, but even now. And so this openness to to work together and, and kind of support each other rather than a competitiveness is, I think, uh, really helpful in, in creating the best research possible. Jose, do you want to add anything on that? Yes, just a little thought. I think this, um, uh, this program has also given me and I can share other other people thoughts that we that we discussed uh, the chance to also let ourselves experiment with things that are uncertain and are not really uh, well structured from the beginning, but it is part of the creative process. So I think it uh, assumes uh, the pedagogical thinking as something that is also very experimental and that allows us to find out new paths for our practice. So that's something I really value a lot. So I feel yeah pretty comfortable working here. I would add uh, trust too, because um, and because between professors and students in um, taking on all these projects, I'm somebody who is um, I'm always generating new ideas, and they're always met with a, well, like they they encourage <laughs> my professors encourage me to take on these projects, and then they trust me to carry them uh, to the end, and they rarely will say don't don't go that way well they will reorient me if needed but um i think there is a lot of uh, trust in in students and for me that's something that's given me a lot of uh confidence um to to and to believe in my ideas and i think um that's something that like personally i've struggled with is confidence and i've i've never felt um, more confident in our department when I have ideas and to be able to share them with um, in in the context and I think that it also well, we collaborate but it's also a safe space to share our ideas um, ideas that aren't always clear that are messy but we kind of have a general we we, we kind of know where we want to go but we don't know and there's always that space to to talk together about them um and i think that's definitely an extremely strong part um and one of the things i enjoy the most about our department and we spoke a little bit about collaboration but what has been really important for me is um i'm from montreal and i straddle the anglophone and francophone world my identity is like right down the middle and i've also had the opportunity to take courses at other universities to collaborate with people from other departments and i think that makes our department so much richer and um, that it also gives us the space to interact with what's going on in the city in montreal and across uh, Canada internationally too. There are options. I'm busy planning an international uh, project at the moment. So there are all these um, possibilities if you do choose to take on graduate work in art education uh, at Concordia University. Do my do you, my colleagues have anything else to add? Yeah, go for it, Victoria. Yeah, of um, continuing off yeah. what Emma was just saying. 
Another element that adds such richness to the program, to the department, is the risk that the program, the department, is willing to take. So I come from an ortho unorthodox channel into the program with a track record. So the support was there because of that, but I didn't necessarily follow the typical channels. And the program was still, the department was still really um, excited to welcome me and to help me find ways to continue this trajectory that I'm on within this situation. So I know I mentioned this earlier, but the notion of support, the actual practice of support is rock yeah. solid. Mm -hmm. And that is an incredibly huge facet. And I didn't say this earlier because I forgot. Mm -hmm. So I want to mention this kind of heading out that I did receive the Social Science Humanities Research Council funding um, to be able to be full time in the program. And the reason why I'm pointing that out is because I don't think I could have done it without the support of the fantastic supervisor that I have, for example, whose time and attention and energy was crucial to helping me really home in on, you know, how to articulate this practice um, within the academic context. The program, the, the art education department is really interested in thinking about uh, processes of opening up what it means to learn and spaces of pedagogy moving forward. Um, within the student work and also, like you were saying, Emma, and also Jose and Stacy, the kind of collaborations that happen outside of the department itself, all of those um, conversations at the micro level and at the macro level are what really make it um, the, the outstanding department that it is. I might just add one, one thing that you made me think of is that I, I think one of the things that makes Concordia particular in their art education program is the different pathways that students come to the program. Um, they're not necessarily, although many are uh, like high school instructors or, or other like teachers within the school system, like or, Emma. Or community. Or community like myself and, and Victoria or the university, so they come from uh, maybe a studio arts uh, instructor background where like both Jose and Victoria, um, but they want to, to learn more about pedagogy. So uh, despite the fact that Victoria says she's not from this typical stream of, of people <laughs> into the program, I would say that perhaps there is no typical stream, but I think that actually makes the program stronger. Um, and I guess I'll leave Emma to, to make finishing remarks. Yeah, well, just, um, I don't know, Jose, do you have anything to add uh, or no? To feed a little bit off of, because as Gret, uh, off what Victoria said as well, I think our, in terms of uh, funding, it is something that is important as graduate students to be able to focus on our research. And that is something um, in Victoria's example that um, I think a lot of our students do manage to get some sort of funding, whether it be from Concordia, from uh, SHIRC or Fonds de Recherche de Quebec. Um, through teaching in our department, there are lots of opportunities to be instructors and teach undergraduate courses, which, which is really important and research assistantships as well, and teaching assistantships, and uh, giving workshops. There are often opportunities to help fund uh, your way through uh, graduate school in ways that are meaningful and help you develop new skills, which I think is important. Um, so that shouldn't, we hope that that, that shouldn't be like a barrier to, um, to coming to Concordia. Our department is very supportive, and it's also something that you can have a, an open discussion with, with uh, professors if it's something that you are concerned with. Um, so as closing remarks, uh, our, did you, you know, our, our department's a little community, as hopefully we've shown, that is open on the city and open to the world really um, to collaborate. And uh, we hope that you'll consider uh, coming to Concordia University and joining us. Thank you. Thank you to the Force Space and to all the staff here who are helping us uh, facilitate our discussion today. Well, thank you so much, uh, Emma, for moderating. Uh, Jose, Victoria, Stacy, thank you so much for coming in today to have this conversation, share your, share your work with all of us. Um, I think it really does speak to the kind of community that's being fostered inside of your department that you volunteered 
last minute short notice to come in here on the Saturday to have this conversation. So we really appreciate your time, energy and insights and for um, getting us all excited about art ed at Concordia Graduate Studies. All right, folks, we're going to close up the Zoom now and wish you a wonderful day. Um, and until next time, enjoy the rest of Open House. Thanks, everybody. Ciao.